Please be seated. When I read scripture and prepare for these sermons, I oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me, get caught up where these stories took place and when they occurred. All of it thousands and thousands of years ago. Exodus was based on events in the 5th and the 6th century before Christ. Before I hear the word, I am often distracted by this. I try to put myself into the sandals of those who are there, of the people in these stories. Can you imagine yourself today being either Peter, John, or James? To begin, they are climbing a mountain to go pray with Jesus. A mountain. We've got mountains in the Gospel, and we've got mountains in the uh, Old Testament reading this morning. In my very skillful Google search capabilities, determined that both of these mountains are bigger than Mount Washington. And back then, it's not like they ran home and get their best mountain climbing boots and a camel back for water, you know what I mean? They probably owned camels, they didn't have a camel back. And, I, and like I said, I get distracted by this. I'm like, what was the preparation that went into those excursions? What did, you, what was that like? And, and also I keep thinking about how incredibly hard those times were, you know, compared to the, the luxuries that we have today. The feast of the transgression is celebrated just before we go into the most prayerful and reflection-filled season of the church calendar, Lent. The transfiguration of Christ shows us who we are. It reveals our origin, our purpose, and the end for which we aim for. The me, the colic today, pulls it all together, which that's what the colic is supposed to do, so it did a good job today. O oh God, before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to hear our cross and be changed into his likeness. Glory to glory. This is a difficult week to talk about transfigured when the world we live in is rather disfigured at this time. I wanted to talk about <clears throat> how the glory of Jesus is in all of us, all of us. That we should be able to see the beauty of our transfiguration. I mean, we're all born in the image and glory of him. All of us, including the poor people on the ground in Ukraine, as well as Mr. Putin. All our children of God. The dilemma, the challenge, which confronts us every day, that the world we live in, the communities we live in, even ourselves, are a combination of good and evil, of light and dark, of transfigured and disfigured. We should be looking at everyone as children of God. That's incredibly difficult to do. We know that. It harkens back to last week's gospel when Jesus said, I say to you, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. That's why the colic we ask to be strengthened and be changed into his likeness. Glory to glory. That's why Paul's letter to the Corinthians implores that we have hope and that we should act with great boldness. Great boldness. Again, imagine yourself as one of the disciples. You're up there on the mountain, and as Jesus is praying, the appearance of his face changes, and his clothes turn into dazzling white. And as you're watching him pray, out of nowhere come two other guys, Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. The Old Testament, all the law, 
One commentary, <coughs> excuse me, I read this week, suggested that Jesus couldn't be transfigured by himself. Moses and Elijah provide community. And community is where the glory of God can shine through. Only when we are together can God's radiant light reach each of you, touch each of our lives. I kind of like that image. I wasn't there yesterday, but I'll bet there was a transfiguration event yesterday when this community of life gathered to prepare meals for those that are in need of the warming shelter. It was light radiating when those meals were being prepared, and the light and the glory of God will also shine when those meals are delivered and eaten. There is that light and that glory when you care for someone in your life, for yourself. There is that light and that glory that shines when we pray for the people of Ukraine. There is that light and that glory every Tuesday and Thursday night in this hall. Now, if you're still with me, imagining yourself as one of the disciples, imagine you are engulfed in this big cloud, it came out of nowhere. You can't see anything. Then you hear God's voice, and I assume it's a booming voice. <laughs> this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And after that, poof, everything's gone. Moses and Elijah are gone. The shiny clothes are gone. The cloud is gone. Jesus is there. The truth and the light is locked there. This is an amazing story. What's more amazing to me is they didn't talk about it afterwards. Can you imagine coming down from that mountain and seeing the other nine disciples and not saying, dude, you should have seen what we just saw up there. <laughs> you know, I just can't believe they kept that quiet. And we didn't read the uh, second half of the bracketed piece of the gospel, but it's in it's in his notes. I'll give you the clip note version. The gospel takes a turn the next day as Jesus is coming down from the mountain. All were astounded by the greatness of God, it says in that scripture. But Jesus seems a bit upset and we're always surprised when Jesus shows his humanness and gets a little upset. Jesus, of course, is greeted by a great crowd coming down from the mountain and a man is calling out, begging for his son to be healed and his demon removed. He lamented that he asked the disciples, but none of them could get it done. Jesus turns around and says, and I assume in a disgusted voice, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Ouch. Remember now, only three of the disciples were up on that mountain. The other nine were not. Only the three got to experience the transfiguration. Only the three had insight into their origin, their purpose, and the end to which they were aiming for. The other nine Jesus, knew Jesus was somewhat special, very special, but they did not witness what Peter, John, and James did. Jesus healed the boy, and all were stunned by the greatness of God. Nevertheless, at the same time, Jesus was saying, come on guys, would you figure this out? I'm not going to be with you much longer. I have some kinship to the nine disciples. I'm still trying to figure it out. We're all still trying to figure it out. But we need to keep trying. Peter and John and James experienced the transfiguration of Christ because they stayed awake despite the weight of sleep. They saw for the first time what had always been. They saw the light of divinity fully manifesting in the human being, Jesus. Our spiritual journey is always a battle between 
falling asleep and staying awake between absence and presence, between darkness and between light. Sleeplessness is not just a physical matter, it's a spiritual issue and condition as well. Spiritual sleep is a form of blindness. It blinds us to the beauty and the holiness of the world, of the people, and of ourselves. Blindness to God's presence in and goodness of creation is what allows us to ignore those who are in need and to ignore ourselves if we're one of those people in need. Let us go into this Lenten season fully awake, eager to learn, eager to grow, strong, and to see the glory in all of God in all. Behold what we are and become what we see.